Sure. Okay, hello, uh, welcome everyone to the uh, Brighton National Education Union uh, webinar event, Education in and Beyond Lockdown. Uh, we've got around 280 people who've registered for this, uh, which is really good. Um, we wanted to give an opportunity for those involved in education and parents to um, discuss and ask questions on some of the important issues at the moment. Um, my name's Paul Shallard, I'm the Secretary of Brighton and Hove NEU and I'm joined on the panel by uh, Caroline Lucas, the Green MP for uh, Brighton Pavilion, uh, Lloyd Russell Moyle, the Labour MP for Kemptown, uh, Dr Mary Balstead, who's the uh, NEU Joint General Secretary, uh, Kath Fisher, who's from Save Our Schools, a, a, um, an organisation that's campaigned on school funding, and Alison Alley, who's from More Than a Score, an organisation that's campaigned on the high, te high stakes testing. Um, we're going to be uh, at times joined by other professionals and you will have the opportunity to ask questions. Um, just a few housekeeping things first of all. We're recording this webinar and we'll post it on social media later this week. Only the panellists can be seen and heard on this call. Participants and the details of participants will not be seen on the recording. To ask a question, please use the Q&A function. Please say your name, who your question is for, and then your question. My technical assistant will be forwarding questions to me and I will select them for the panelists. We will try our best to get through as many as possible in the time we have, but we won't be able to field all the questions. You can also use the chat function to say hello to each other and discuss the topics between yourselves. Please don't ask questions in the chat please put the questions in the Q&A. Now we've got uh, three main issues we're gonna discuss. Firstly, the reopening schools, when and how is it safe to do so? Uh, secondly, COVID-19. If we're not having the lockdown, we need an alternative to the lockdown. That has to be community testing, widespread community testing and contact tracing. And we are interested in how that could happen with the current uh, rate of new infections, over 4,000 new infections yesterday. It's going to take more than 18,000 testing and contact tracers to deal with that new, uh, to, with the amount of um, new cases coming on board. Test four, we need a whole school strategy. We need protocols to be put in place to test a whole school or a college when a case occurs and for isolation to be strictly followed. And test five, protection for the vulnerable. Vulnerable staff and uh, staff who live with vulnerable people must work from home. They must be able to fulfil their professional responsibilities to the extent that it's possible. And uh, plans must also be in place to specifically address the issue of vulnerable parents and vulnerable relatives if and when children go back to school. Oh, wait, thanks, Mary. Um, Lloyd, would you like to add to that? Lloyd, do you want to come in yes, next? Sorry, I was just uh, taking a little while to get my... Uh microphone working. But look, uh, schools need to reopen eventually, but they should only do so when it is safe. And we know that it's safe for them to do so. The problem with this disease um, is that we just don't know a lot of stuff. We don't know how it spreads in children, for example. Some people have said that children don't even get it, so they can't even be carriers. And other people say that they still might be vectors of that they might get it, just not show symptoms, and then help spread the infection. We don't know how it affects um, people in terms of long-term immunity, um, and we don't know actually how long uh, it lasts in terms of transferring from one item to another in a serious way. We have some ideas of all of those things, but we don't know for sure. And when you don't know things for sure, the sensible way is to follow a precautionary principle. And that means that you err on the side of caution rather than on the side of, um, you know, kind of running full steam into it. So Rebecca Long Bailey from the Labour Party um, has said, before we even start considering the date of reopening, the date of return, we need to answer, not test, but we need to think about a number of questions. So we need to actually think about what happens to vulnerable children who have health conditions. We need to think about what happens to staff, particularly staff who are at risk. What about people who are um, generally at risk? 
are they exempted from coming back and how do we make sure that that um that actually it remains the the rate of uh, reproduction below zero or below one because that's the key there's no we cannot reopen anything unless the rate of reproduction is below significantly below one um, uh, and at the moment, in some areas, for East Sussex, for example, is a good example, where in some parts of East Sussex, it, the reproduction rate is still about one. Uh, in Brighton and Hove, it's below one. We seem to have, Brighton got it earlier, it seems to have kind of petered off earlier, but I'm not a scientist, so, it, and, and no one actually knows about these things. So those are the Labour Party's tests. My gut says that what we shouldn't be doing is running headlong into this. There are some issues that we need to raise, particularly around children with special educational needs. And it's very difficult sometimes for those parents who now aren't being offered any respite for the care of their, of their child in this period. And so it might well be that what we do is certain specialist areas, you come for certain other plans, particularly with children with special educational needs. But in terms of opening up whole scale schools, mainstream schooling in the large sector, I think we're at least a few weeks off, if not longer for that. And there is an argument actually, that as we enter the summer term, that it might well be that you say, let's actually just reset in September. But we then have to think about what we do in between time to make sure children do not lag behind. Brighton College is opposite me. And I've got a teacher who lives around the corner from me. He said they're doing full schools, full instruction for examinations. What we can't have, is Brighton College or other private schools getting a huge advantage during this time compared to state schools? So what we also have to do is make sure there is a level playing field when we go back. Lovely. Thanks, Lloyd, um, bringing out the complexity of the issue, I think. Um, Kath, can you uh, tell us what you think? Yeah, sure. So when I've asked to speak from a parental perspective, and I just want to say that every parent's Every, every person's experience is different of, um, of this lockdown, of this crisis. Every parent's experience is different and every child's experience is different. And that's obviously financial situation going into this crisis was a challenge. Um, but also family dynamics, how many parents, how many kids, um, whether people are working or not and whether people have been bereaved and whether they're experiencing grief. So th all of those things will shape whether, um, you know, people when schools and when people want or feel comfortable spent sending their children back into schools what almost everybody has in common is they want to keep their children and their families safe and it's a very unclear situation about what is safe um, so I think there's been virtually unanimous concern about this mooted date of the 1st of June um, and so people are worried about that um, I want to talk a little bit about transition and the transition back into school is going to be really hard particularly for children um, with SEND um, with any sort of additional um, challenges, um, anyone who's been bereaved, and for children who, for whatever reason, have spent a lot of time out of school, sitting on PlayStation, playing Fortnite. All of those people have different reasons for finding it difficult to re-enter into um, an education setting. Um, and that needs time to plan. It needs staff in, to be in place, and it's going to need funding as well. And um, we've campaigned on funding. We know there wasn't enough going into this crisis. We're worried that there's an opportunity. There's, there's been some failure to deliver on com funding commitments that were made before this crisis. So those are all things that we'd be looking for to see in any reopening of schools. Lovely. Thanks. Very important to get the parents' perspective. Um, Caroline, can I ask you to come in next? Yes, thank you very much. And thank you, Paul, for the opportunity to, um, to join this important debate. I very much agree with um, the five tests that were set out by the National Education Union. Um, and I think it's vital that those tests are met before schools are reopened. I completely understand there is a very high price to be paid for keeping our schools closed. And I'm very mindful of what that means in terms of heightening inequalities. Um, but I think that the bottom line is that we have to keep people safe. What worries me is, particularly when I hear a date of the 1st of June being suggested, the government, frankly, has got so much still to do to put in place before that safety can be guaranteed. The idea that we're going to be able to do that by the 1st of June, I think, is highly unlikely unless there's a bit of massaging of, of, of the facts and the figures, as we've seen somewhat over the issue of, of 100,000 tests. So when to me, you know, the whole issue of community led testing, tracing and isolation that has to be in place before we even think about schools going back. 
And sadly, the government has just been incredibly slow about getting that going. And they're still talking about a very top down national system using phone apps rather than what so many of the public health experts are telling them, which is that what we need is much more decentralized, locally based people on the ground. Yes, with phone apps, but not thinking that the technology is going to be there kind of instead of that really grassroots presence. So there's a huge amount that needs to be done in terms of the investment in that test trace isolate regime, in terms of really understanding what social distancing can look like in, in schools. And I wanted to really underline the point about um, schools that, that cater for children with special education needs. I think the government has entirely overlooked that whole sector. Um, and it's entirely clear that if you've got children with very complex needs, you know, they're not going to understand or be able to follow necessarily the whole issue of, of some degree of social distancing. And yet at the same time, we know that their families are under massive pressure having them at home the whole time. So at the very least, I think what we need is some properly funded government respite for parents or people with, with, uh, with, with, with family members who have special and complex needs. Because at the moment, I think they're kind of the forgotten ones. You know, we've, we've kind of caught up with the fact that, you know, lots of low paid people in the NHS or, or in the care in care homes, you know, have been people that we haven't properly valued. Well, how much more is that case for, for people who are carers at home who are paid an insulting £67 a week? I mean, I know it's not about the money, but the money does matter. And I think that is a reflection of, of the worth, unfortunately, that, that is currently put on people that are caring at home. So let's make sure that we get those five tests that Mary set out and put as much pressure on the government to get them going and, and to really start investing in that as, as fast as possible because I do recognise that for as long as schools are closed that is a major problem too but the bottom line is we've got to keep people safe and right now I don't think the government's doing that. Lovely, thanks Caroline. Um, the sort of special educational needs are uh, very important. Um, Alison, can I ask you to come in finally on the panel? Yeah, sure. Well, you know, to echo what everybody has said so far, safety has to be the primary concern. As a parent, I would want to know that my daughters are safe, that all children are safe to go back, and also that all their teaching staff are safe. So until, um, and, you know, I, th I think there's a real deficit of trust in the government to date on how they've handled this crisis. Um, they, 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 you know, safety of of their people does not seem to have been the the main motivator at many many steps along the way so again as as Kath was saying this sort of slightly random first of june date that's been plucked out of the air uh, I, there's there's very little sense of trust from parents in that being a date that that would be backed by uh, either teaching professionals or or scientists who are not under the influence of any government advisors who may or may not be sitting in on those meetings. So, um, you know, that's uh, that, that that I'll keep it as short as that because I think everybody else has really covered the topic well. Yeah, thanks, Alison. Um, at this point, I'm going to bring in Anna Watson, who um, is a teacher who works in um, a nursery school within in Brighton and Hove for, for her perspective on the question of schools reopening. Anna? Hi, uh, thanks for inviting me. I'm, yeah, I'm a teacher at a nursery school at the local one in Brighton and Hove, and I'm also a, a parent of a secondary school child. Um, so, I mean, we obviously do want, like I said, we want schools to be open, but it has to be safe that you know that's the first thing it has got to be and we've got to follow the um neu five tests before doing so and even when we get to that point and those five tests you know they're there they're in place um there's so many questions about you know it has to be phased we can't fully open in one go um I st even with it being phased or children in rotation, I still can't imagine how we would still implement um, social distancing in schools from secondary. You know, they're massive thinking about children moving about the schools within the classrooms. And obviously, um, I've got a perspective of working in a um, nursery school where even now with our small numbers, there is no social, social distancing. Um, they don't understand it. It's impossible for, for them to adhere to it. So we can't go back until we have got that um, comprehensive testing and tracing. It's 
I question now, even in nurseries, how safe is it now for the staff and the children? Because they, you know, they are all together. The numbers are rising as well as private nurseries are shutting. So there's pressure on um, the maintained nurseries to take those children on. Um, things like that, you know, our provision is play based. Children gravitate towards each other. We can't keep them apart. This, you know, there's things about thinking about you know, people might say, oh, sit them at a table. We have babies, three to four year olds. You can't do that. <laughs> you know, in reception in year one, that's going to be difficult. Uh, in nurseries, and it's the same with like, it, uh, comparable to uh, special schools, we do personal care, you know, from nappy changing, toileting, hygiene, managing hand washing, all that. It's, um, and it's all in close contact. Coughing, sneezing. That happens on a daily occurrence. We, with they're saying, some people are saying children don't pass the virus on. They or they're asymptomatic and they do. Like so, we don't know. So at this point, we don't know. So we still have to be safe. Um, young children bite. It's part of their developmental um, development to express their emotions. That happens. Then we have a number of um, a lot of the maintained nurseries have a lot of the um, of children with EH beginning to have AHC people and send children who have one-to-one -one support so quite similar to special schools so there's you know there's all the risks in, involved there um you know there's there's so many questions we need um guidance on what provision schools are going to offer what they are what they're not what they're going to remove especially in nursery schools you know water sensory that's all going to pass the virus on um, group times, we do group times. If, if we're full, we have 13 children on a carpet close, you know, to each other. We can't do social, our nursery's expected to do group times. How are they going to teach in primary schools, you know, it, it, with the nature of the classrooms? Lunch times, I haven't got a clue how that is going to work, you know. Um, we, ha we have to reduce the amount of children. In, I feel in my nursery, we're rising we're probably getting to too too many if we bring them all back you know we can have up to 93 and four year olds on one particular day um it's just it is really worrying so we do need some clear guidance on that um there's you know the staffing how many staff should we have? Should we have a um, one member of staff to do the cleaning routines and main trying to maintain some kind of social distancing with the children? I mean, it all differs so much in nurseries now nationwide. We need some clarity on that everybody is following the same uh, social distancing in some way or provision. You know, and also I think we need to really think about staff you know, and the social distancing for staff. You know, a lot of schools, they have offices, they're small spaces, they have to work next to each other. In, you know, in um, lunch times, the staff rooms, they've got smaller and smaller. So I think some schools don't even have them anymore. Um, so, you know, all that needs to be taken in, into account. Anna, can I just stop you there? I'm just Sorry. kind of conscious. Th no, thank you very much for that contribution yeah. um, of the limited time we've got for questions. I think we yeah. only really have, have one uh, time for probably one question on this issue. This comes from uh, Anushka um, and she says, from my experience of working in a primary school during lockdown, where I had nine children in my class, it was really difficult to keep them socially distanced in the classroom and stop them sharing equipment between themselves. At playtime, the children did not socially distance at all. Do we need to just accept that social distancing is impossible at primary school? And if so, how on earth do we reopen safely? Um, does anyone on the panel want to come back specifically on that question? Well, I... I Mary, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think, you know, the TGS did a survey of teachers over the weekend and um, over 90% of them said, um, um that they were not you know that it was impossible to socially distance in schools and i think that's probably right and i think it's very interesting today on the today program what we're hearing now is less about social distancing and more about viral load and i think the government's realized that it's very difficult to justify a return to schools with social distancing when when people just think that's impossible so now they're they're turning it to 
it's not social distancing, but it's the amount of time you spend with someone with the virus. I think on either count, that really raises very difficult issues for schools because if it's viral load, and the research is in which it is uncertain, but it seems that children carry, even if children don't get the virus very badly, they carry the virus. Then if you're a teacher in a class with 10 children and you're there for five hours of them, you're there for a long time to carry the viral load. So um, I think we have to sort of keep social distancing clearly in mind, but also be aware, and I'm sorry to have to say this, that in the, in the, in the sort of um, desire to get the country up and running, the, we might not get evidence-based policy, but policy-based evidence. Thanks, Mary. I'll just ask one other quick question for someone to come in on. Um, this is from Alice. Um, my daughter has ASC and has an, um, an education and health and care plan. She's in year six at a local primary. How would the council support children with special educational needs with the transition from uh, primary to secondary um, when they're particularly vulnerable and need enhanced support programs? Anyone want to come in on that just very quickly? before we move on to the next issue. I think that's a, a, certainly an important uh, consideration um, for the council and individual schools to uh, think about. I think, um, I, 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 just, I think that there is, that there is particularly some general need for supporting all children, but particularly children with uh, special educational needs and statements. Uh, and, 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 and plans to ensure that their integration back into their school is smooth. Many of those children will um, have, if they're moving into a new school, that will be more difficult because of the gap that they've had. But even going back to the school that they may well have already been in, many of those children will rely on regularity and patterns and the break of that pattern for such a long period will make that integration much harder. And so there does need to be thinking and resources for this. But as we all know, the resources for special educational needs more broadly is woeful. Sorry, thanks, Lloyd. Let's move on to the, the second of the, the three questions, um, the, the three big questions. Um, and that's about assessment and testing. What should it look like this year? And what should it look like in the future? Um, Alison, can I ask you to come in first on this from More Than A Score? Yeah, sure. So for anybody who doesn't know More Than A Score is a, um, a campaigning organisation um, asking for a complete overhaul of high state, the high stakes testing regime in primary schools. Um, we, we are a coalition of uh, unions strongly supported by the NEU, uh, academics, teachers, parent groups. Um, we've done a lot of research which shows that um, pretty much only the DfE um, actually is pro the current uh, high stakes testing regime which sees children tested in from September if the government plows uh, forges ahead with its plans we'll see children tested at primary school in a high stakes as high stakes way in five out of seven primary school years so i think um the advent of covid19 has thrown up some really really interesting questions for us uh, i'm sure i'm not alone in noticing that the announcement of sats tests being halted this year uh, was not exactly met with um howls of protest um, I would imagine uh, with everything else teachers have on their plates, it was just one bit, huge relief for teachers. I think parents either felt relief, uh, jubilation or utter indifference. Um, and, you know, that range of reactions really gives the lie uh, to this idea that formal government tests somehow underpin, um, underpin high standards in our schools. Um, they show them for what they are, which is a total waste of everybody's time, uh, uh, while at the same time putting head teachers, teachers, that filters down to, to the pupils, and by the time you get to SATs, that can also come home into the home environment, um, just putting this immense, immense amount of pressure um, onto, onto young young children um, and all of this because the government is obsessed with data and with league tables 
Um, so Thanks, you know, my good. hope, obviously, is a, a, have I overrun? No, that, that's fine. Sorry. Okay. And I just very quickly mentioned baseline. Uh, because this is uh, this is a new standardised test the government wants to bring in in September. Uh, More than a score is calling on the government to cancel reception baseline assessment for 2021. Uh, research has already showed that the tests are pointless, unreliable, and can cause feelings of failure in four-year-olds at the very best of times. Uh, at this particular time, I think schools and children will need it like an absolute hole in the head. It's the last thing they need. So heads and teachers have become very, very vocal <laughs> about uh, wanting baseline dropped. Uh, they want to be able to spend their time making four-year-olds feel settled. They're obviously concerned about welfare and all the other issues. So, um, you know, that, that again, it's another one to, to, to look at and we very much hope that if all of us join together, we can actually uh, get baseline written off the agenda for 2021. Well, thanks, uh, Alison. Um, can I just request of all the, the panellists, if we can try, and, and this isn't the criticism of, of anyone, um, but just try and uh, keep our um, contributions as, as short and snappy as we can. I'm kind of conscious that I want to try and get in more questions at the end of the session. Um, Caroline, over to you. Yes, well, that should be um, easy to be short because I agree with everything that uh, Ali has said um, and, um, you know, it's uh, on to pay tribute to, to her and everything that more than a score has been doing uh, in the city and, and in terms of lobbying uh, up at Westminster. I mean, my view has always been that children are over assessed in our education system. And so I hope that the need to find other ways to measure progress um, is going to be one of the longer lasting changes that might result from this crisis. I've always argued that, you know, we need to trust teachers more um, and I trust teachers to assess students' performances, taking into account achievements to date and potential. I think that needs to be done in a very transparent way so people have confidence in the ways in which teachers are going to be making those judgments. But I think that, you know, if, if, if one thing could come out of this, that might be that A, there would be much less emphasis on, on, on testing and, and I think the baseline assessments are just you know, there's so much evidence to suggest that they don't work as well as being incredibly stressful. But if out of this we could get to a situation where we put less emphasis on assessment and we trust teachers more, then maybe, just maybe, you know, something positive could, could come. Lovely, thank you. And uh, Mary, what's your view? Um, I, I think that um, very few journalists or ministers or anybody have really seriously thought through the implications of um, COVID-19 and the assessment regime. I think the first point I would like to make is that what has become absolutely clear is how fragile our education system is because we put all our eggs in the exam basket. We have an education system where at GCSE students are doing 35 hours of exams over a two week period. Now, if you think about the time that they haven't been in school now, and then you think about the fact that when we do go back to school, it's going to be on a staged and phased basis. That even when you've got most year groups in, which may not be for months, then um, you're going to be having uh, them on a rotor basis probably. So it's not just that children and young people are missing out of school now, but they're going to be missing out of school um, for months to come yet. Then we need to have a completely different sort of assessment system. It can't just be GCSEs as they're currently overloaded with content. It can't be A-levels overloaded with content because there isn't the time to teach that content and because, um, you know, they cannot be examined in that way. So there are profound implications for assessment at A-level, at GCSE, at Year 6 SATs and Baseline. They're profound for all of them. And what we have to do as a general principle is ensure that teacher assessment, which has been so denigrated, but can now apparently be the basis for prediction and allotting of grades at GCSE and at A-level, that that is built into the system, that teachers are trained to do it better. They're trained to do it without bias against black um, pupils and against, um, uh, uh, particularly against ethnic minority pupils, uh, in male bias in assessment. And that they, it absolutely forms a robust part of the system because Next year, the effects of COVID-19 are not just for now, they're, they're, they're going to be with us for a lot longer and we really need to start 
government needs to start thinking through rather than just talking about catch up and getting exam years in so they can do exams doing the sort of exams they shouldn't be doing anyhow they're not fit for purpose Great. thanks mary now i can bring in kath yeah um i'm absolutely agree with everything that's been said about the assessment and i think this is a real i mean as i am a parent of, of primary age children so more focused on sats than the other the other kinds of assessment but this gives us an opportunity to rethink and rethink the value of that kind of testing which i'm very skeptical about and whether the value they bring is worth the cost um, and one thing we haven't talked about so far, but it's just about, I think lots of parents have become aware of what um, their children are being taught. Um, and um, as, as, home, as, as we're doing home learning, I think um, we're finding that um, it, it's not sitting down and correcting, um, you know, naming bits of grammar in a sentence that is inspiring our children. It's following their interests. It's doing topic-based learning. And I think, um, thinking about what we're teaching in schools and what kind of skills are needed and what kinds of attitudes are needed to respond to this kind of crisis. You know, where we've seen the incredible sort of progress made is in people working together, it's an innovation, it's teamwork. It's not, it's not this kind of rote learning that seems to have you know, come in um, and things that can be tested. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a chance to rethink curriculum as well as, as the way in which assessment's undertaken. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Kath. And at this point, I want to bring in um, Hilde Mitchell, um, who is a, a head in the primary sector in Brighton and Hove, and also the representative for the National Association of Head Teachers, who, um, which the NEU works closely with. Hilde. Hi, thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, I agree with a lot of what people have already said, and it's very interesting hearing parents' views and parents' growing understanding of the relationship between what children are learning and what children are being assessed on um, and for me assessment this year for our primary children is going to have to be all about as the best assessment for teachers should be about what do they need next and that will be very different for, for our children because of what they've just been through and it will involve knowing what they need next in terms of knowledge in the curriculum but also what do they need next in terms of their transition back into school their social and emotional well-being um, and that and we need to have an assessment which is based on the relationships that we have with those children to be able to understand that um, for that reason i am incredibly worried about the government pushing through with baseline for reception children who will not have have missed who will have missed a lot of their socialization in nursery setting and for whom school is likely to be much much more difficult um, and i can just see in my head some horrific picture of teachers in masks trying to baseline children that they do not know and who have not been away from their parents over the past few months and i think we must do everything we can to prevent that kind of thing happening. Um, I think what's also interesting is that that baseline alongside the key stage one and key stage, stage two SATs does not exist to find out what the children need next. It exists only to be able to judge schools. And if we've seen anything in the last few months, it's that schools are very, very much more than just that. And I think that we must take this opportunity to pause, to think about what assessment is for, um, think about how we might be doing that better, rather than sleepwalk back into doing what we've been doing. And I think very key in that is understanding and parents understanding these different kinds of assessment. So I think that the, um, the issues that are affecting my teenage daughter, for example, thinking about going through towards taking her options, are very different and I think can be explored very differently to high stakes and very pressurised um, exams which are very damaging to our young people's mental health um, but for um, judging schools we need to be thinking about how how do we really um, work out what schools do well and how do we help schools improve and do things better um, that is not using this kind of assessment I think we have to pause we have to take stock Thanks, Hildy. Um, time for a couple of questions. Um, I've got one from Rachel. Is there an argument for shifting the whole curriculum back a year? And then I've got a question from Nikki. 
um, about the future of GCSEs, not just in the immediate future, but in the long term. The cancellation of the exams this year replaced with teacher assessment and a general sense that we need a new normal after the lockdown gives the opportunity to open up discussions around whether terminal exams at 16 are outdated now that it's not possible to leave education until 18 and whether it's desirable to narrow the curriculum and cause anxiety to so many young people at this stage at this age sorry um yeah those are those are the uh, two questions anyone from the panel wants to come in hildy um can i come in on this um thing about um potentially um, going back a year and this idea that our children are falling behind. And I take Lloyd's comment about the most advantaged children may be still moving forward. And I think that is a big issue and it's a bigger issue than just for schools and education. It is a society issue and it's one that is at the structure of our, of our very, you know, the fabric of our society. Um, but I was, before as a teacher, I was an anthropologist and I'm very aware that any, um, pinpointing of what is age related or what is um, expected is very historically and culturally specific and actually if we choose to take that apart we can and we don't have to have this idea that our children are all falling behind somehow and that we've got to cram them full of stuff to help them catch up I would rather us focus on the structural inequalities that underpin the, the damaging gaps that exist for children and thinking about what is it that is really needed in our society right now at various points. And that point about post about 16 being the point where we make those judgments, summative um, uh, assessments, I think is a really well made one actually from a, the question. Well, thank you. Caroline, do you want to come in on this? I agree with, with, with what Hildy said. I think that's a, a, a healthy way of looking at it. And I wanted to focus though on the question about the GCSEs and whether we still need them. And it seems to me that so much time is taken trying to get kids through exams. And it's such a waste of all the other wonderful things that we could be teaching them. And I think it speaks to a model of education that still sees you know, children as kind of empty vessels that you fill with information. And then if you're lucky at a certain date on a certain time, they might just regurgitate it in the way that you've told them. But that is such a small, narrow idea of what education is about. And if instead we could use that time, which currently is being used to coach children how to how to pass exams and instead used it to, to, to really focus on inquiry led education, really kind of inspiring children to to ask the questions and to learn about the issues that, that are going to be facing them in the world that they're about to be emerging into. That I think will be a much better use of time. So I, I think there's an, ar an argument here for, for going back to first principles, to thinking about the purpose of education, the purpose of assessment, and maybe we can learn something from this that would help us <coughs> as an education system in the future that, that does better for our kids. Thanks a lot. Lots of sort of positive ideas about how things could be changed uh, for the better. At this point, I'm, Lloyd, very quickly, and then I'm going to move us on to the next issue. Lloyd? I, I think that there is, um, I agree with everything that's just been said in terms of uh, about examinations. Um, I think that there is something to be said about reviewing why we try and compare children between different schools as well. And I think that that is also, you know, kind of, even if you shift the examination period to another time, or even if you get teachers to kind of grade what their um, students are, I think we also need to move away from this idea that one school is competing against another school in this kind of uh, 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 system of, of, of competition, not only within pupils, but between schools, because that also prevents teachers very often being able to support the need of the child and the pupil at that moment, because they're constantly having to think about, well, how are these people compared to everything else? And what's really interesting is one of the things that the government have asked each to do is not do that this time. They've said to them, can you just rank your children within school? Who you think is the top, who you think maybe is the bottom? Now, I'm not saying that that should go forward, but that is an interesting step change away from ranking children between schools, just within school. And maybe if we can harness some of that and reduce that kind of league table competition between schools, there could be some positives. I'm not saying that what the government have proposed is the end result there are steps towards it which i think we mustn't let go of thanks lloyd 
If I can move us on to our third um, main topic, and this is homeschooling and working from home. What should schools be doing at the moment? Um, and I was going to ask uh, Kath if you want to come in on this first of all. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think, um, as I started by saying um, with uh, that everyone's experience of this is different and there's so many different factors that shape how parents and their children are experiencing this crisis. I think one thing that pretty much everyone has in common is a huge respect for teachers and what you do every day. And this has been an ongoing theme on all the sort of groups that I'm on. I mean, I've got two children and I can't get two of them to sit down for any of the time to do what I've asked them to. So I think huge respect for teachers and you know, hopefully that will permeate out um, and, and retain but um, I think a lot of parents I know some parents and I saw there was somebody in the in the chat who are making it work who are on top of it who are providing their children with with brilliant education and that's great and you know huge respect to, to people who are doing that and I, but I know that's not a universal experience um, I know that lots of the parents on my son's whatsapp group are, are just you know aren't engaging with the stuff that's being sent home from school they're overwhelmed for whatever reason um, whether that's standing in queues whether it's trying to juggle working um, or looking after people um, so I think there are a lot of people who have given up entirely on on the stuff that school is being is sending home and a lot feeling very overwhelmed by the material that school is being sent uh, it, it's been sent the material being sent home even though a lot of it comes with a very useful message around you know this is we're sending this out uh, you don't you can you know, do as much or a little a little of it as you like um i, I think there, there is an issue there however lots of people are doing other kinds of learning you know um, lots, of people, lots of people are baking they're doing um you know people who have time to who aren't working all hours they're doing things together that they might not ordinarily have time to do and i think that's been really positive they're able to follow their children's lead so i know someone who's spending um the next this week focusing on slugs because that's what her son's really into and there's all sorts of stuff that you can do around slugs um but i think that um in terms of what the support that schools are given i think it needs it, it probably needs to be as targeted targeted to the particular needs of parents and children and that that's difficult and demanding and i think we also need to remember that lots of parent lots of teachers are also parents or carers and so on and they're experiencing these challenges themselves so I think one thing one thing that people are getting concerned about is social isolation amongst children and thinking of ways in which that they can connect with their um, connect with their peers um, over the coming period. So I think that's a, a challenge. A challenge for schools is how to provide a, a more collective um, experience with all the issues around. That I understand there are around safeguarding. But I think overall, the stuff that's been sent home by my school in particular, particularly where it's topic fo focused, acknowledges you may have children of different ages working together, has been great. And I think if children, if parents aren't engaging with it, I don't think that's necessarily to do with that's not the failure of the school that's just all the crazy circumstances that people are in at the moment so thank you for everything the teachers are doing thanks Kath that's it's really good to get sort of a sense of what the reality is um, I think for parents in dealing with this and um, Mary can I ask you to uh, give you any new perspective on that yeah so um, I had a massive twitter row with uh, Andrew Adonis who used to be the school's minister uh, in the early 2000s this weekend because he said that schools are letting uh, children down if they weren't providing a full online curriculum. Um, and that offended a huge amount of teachers and leaders who are working really hard um, to, to provide help for learning. You know, the fact of the matter is we have over 1 million children in the UK with no internet access. The only access in their home is through mobile phones. So they can't do online learning. The fact of the matter is you cannot replicate school in every children's home and um, some of the online learning stuff which has been produced um, um, has has been of variable quality um, schools are doing what they can to support children's learning at home but they can't but but they simply can't re teachers can't replicate themselves in every in every home learning is a communal act children learn from each other as well as from their teacher and schools exist for a purpose and a reason they exist in order to enable children to socialize learn together learn from each other and learn from their teachers and learning is a communal act in schools so um the neu's focus has very much been we've, we've um, set up a parents microsite 
it's been uh, accessed now over I think it's um, hundreds of thousands of times and on that microsite you've got good very creative uh, things for parents to do with children not worksheets but um, penguins getting lost in the South Pole and it's geography it's drama it's uh, art it's a bit of mathematics really good creative themed work um, th which children will enjoy and uh, it's clear to me that one of the key things we're going to have to do is recognize that um, children need to be more independent learners I mean that I'll just say this to finish uh, the fact of the matter is in England we come third of the international league tables for rote learning so um, uh, Ireland comes second and Uruguay comes first that is no league table we want to be leading on. We don't want to be leading on rote learning. And the reason why that happens is because the only way we assess is through exams. What has to come out of here will have to be different, but I would just caution that it will be easy. Uh, the right are massing. They're very uh, aware that what they have imposed on our system is under attack and they're looking to defend it. They're keeping quiet now, but they won't stay quiet. Thanks, Mary. Um, Alison, can you come in? Is your experience similar to Kath's? Um, yes, it, I, I mean, yeah, I'd really like to echo what Kath says um, with, with, a, with a just quick little snapshot of one of the things that's been going around on, on social media, which was a teacher saying, um, you know, we know that you're, not, you're just not going to be able to teach your child all the things we teach them at school don't worry i'm a teacher i have superpowers we will take care of that when the children come back just keep your kids as happy healthy and safe as you can and that just kind of took off all through uh, all through the month of april um i think you know uh, i i agree with kath and, and certainly other parent campaigners have fed back uh, similarly that you know teachers and schools have uh, adapted admirably and at lightning speed to a very very altered teaching landscape and are quite clearly doing the best um, in a circumstance that none of us <laughs> um, you know none of us have ever been in before um, as a parent, I'd also like to say that, you know, what, what I'm hoping for our, and I'm going to bring in assessment again, as Mary has done, because, you know, what I'm hoping, I think she's quite right. And, you know, parents are more aware than ever of the extent to which assessment dictates what our kids are doing at school, because a lot of them have come back with these uh, SATS learning pack, packs or, or phonics prep packs and um, you know but parents are getting real first-hand experience of what our teachers are obliged to make our children plow through um, so I'm feeling that really a, a sort of microscopic protein coated uh, organism has sort of cracked apart um, the education system as we know it uh, who would have guessed that that would happen uh, and, and just reveal the extent to which uh, so much of our education is based on assessment and it seems to me that at this time teachers parents and children sort of veering way off the government script because it's simply a totally irrelevant script at this time and I agree with Mary that it will you know remain irrelevant for for a long time to come but I think there's going to be a massive fight back and I think the more that we can all come together and fight for a system where teachers are free to teach what they love and children are free to learn uh, love what they learn without being limited by these stupid one-size-fits-all tests then uh, we'll have a much happier healthier uh, and more educated society moving forward for whatever challenges are around the corner climate is definitely one of them in our faces now after corona thanks alison caroline what do you think i think i agree with everything that, that alison and, and and mary and kath have have said um i think Kath particularly I think started off what she was saying by saying everyone's experience is different and I think that is true and I heard a, a really nice phrase um, that you might have come across saying that we're all weathering the same storm but we're not in the same boat and there's that sense that you know the same situation if you like that we're all facing really manifests itself differently depending on you know the capacities that you have uh, whether or not you have internet in your home whether or not you're trying to work whether or not you're trying to struggle just to get food on the on the table 
And so the bottom line, I think, in terms of the question about what, what should schools be doing is, is just giving as much reassurance and support to parents, whatever their circumstances are, as they, as they can. I saw that same thing on, on Facebook, you know, the thing that kind of went viral with the teacher basically saying, you know, you're doing good, don't beat yourself up. And, and I think, you know, it ends by saying, you know, you're doing enough. And I think the worst thing we could do is try to disempower parents or make them feel, you know, that they're not doing um, as much as they should because so many of them are, are struggling as it is. And if they are able to give their, their kids, you know, the, the sense of love and security, that's, that's absolutely the baseline. And anything above that is, you know, is, 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 is to be welcomed, but, but is, is kind of icing on the top, if you like. So um, I, I hope that as much as possible, there can be, you know, tailored support for parents. I hope that, you know, the kind of groups that are kind of setting up to be peer support, can be as as vital as possible because I think I think the big thing coming out of all of this is just how scary it is to feel isolated and it's hard enough doing everything that people are trying to do in terms of keep their kids educated and possibly keep a job and keep keep a, a roof over their heads but the sense of doing all of that and feeling that you're on your own I, I think is must be the worst thing so as much as, as we can to kind of spread that sense of solidarity and just to say whatever you're doing you know hang in there you're doing what you can and and, and that's that's mm. mostly probably enough yeah a better kind of baseline thanks for that and um, lloyd um thank you uh, thank you very much no I, I i agree with actually what um what a large number of people have said here i think if we are looking at the inequalities issue um Part of the problem with uh, inequalities is about experiences for children. And so I think a lot of parents can get too caught up in thinking they have to teach their children about, you know, kind of how to do algebra, complex equations, the, you know, the periodic table or, or whatever level you're doing, you know, simple, simple arithmetic even, actually, um, or, or, or times tables. And actually, one of the best things that a lot of parents can do at this stage is to give children experiences during this COVID uh, crisis. And of course, try and weave in knowledge and facts. But if you are doing things that involve, say, a daily walk in the countryside where you are looking at the plants and the fauna and flora, that probably is an experience that they wouldn't get in, in other circumstances and will allow them to excel because when they then go back to school and have to write about their experiences, they are able to be inspired by so much. I, I, my next door neighbour was a, um, uh, a teacher at the local primary school, um, which um, uh, I live in East Brighton. Um, and he said after the holidays, it was shocking how he would ask the children to write about their school holidays. And the level of inspiration was always so low because they would just say, well, I've sat in front of the TV. And that was the thing that held them back in their creative writing. That was the thing that held them back in their English and language development. And so I don't think we should expect parents to take over the role of teacher. Yes, we'll have to work out how we fill in some of those knowledge gaps because you do need some base knowledge. But teachers are the experts for that. And we'll have to support that when kids go back to school. What we must do now is empower parents to give those experiences to children. And that's actually what traditionally has been the difference between children who excel in school more broadly and who not. The parents who take their children to museums or on trips tend to then have that wider knowledge basis. So I think that's where parents should be really focusing and they shouldn't be worrying too much. And they should be using those fantastic resources that the NEU and others have got to aid those kinds of discussions and that more experiential learning. Experiential learning is the key for, 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 for parental learning. Sorry, thanks Lloyd. Um, at this point, can I bring in Liz Ritson, who is um, a teacher in a Brighton and Hove secondary school. Liz. I'm really just going to talk about things from a secondary teacher's um, perspective. Um, really echoing a lot of what people have said is you cannot replicate the classroom online. So for example, when I'm teaching, I can scan a room, I can see who's understanding it, who looks a bit bored, who looks like they've, you know, zoned out. Um, and I can go and I can talk to those people direct or I can 
represent that information in a different way. And you can't do that online. Um, and I think that's one of my um, big fears is that the government thinks that actually you can deliver all this content online and, and you really can't. Um, also echoing what a lot of people have said about the different working environments for both teachers and staff and um, for parents and carers and their children. So there's an assumption that staff have everything set up at home, that they have access to a laptop. I mean, it's incredibly difficult to make resources if you've only got access to a tablet. And in some schools, teachers are not provided with laptops, whereas they may have a desktop at school, but they don't necessarily have a laptop at home. And they may just have access to a tablet. And how you access or provide work um, on a tablet or a smartphone is very different from how you would do it on a laptop. Um, so that's really talking about the working um, environment for staff and also the fact they have caring responsibilities as well. Um, online working takes so much longer to mark and I say this just because um, I've just had to mark online the coursework for my year 11s whereas if I'd been in class if I could have done this at school it would have taken me a fraction of the time. But actually having to go into every single child's electronic folder, accessing the work and then sort of giving it a grade has taken me a phenomenally long time. And it's just made me feel like a complete slave um, to the computer. I, mean, I was quite happy to do it for year 11s because of the um, high impact it could you know, um, have on their final grades. But it's not something I'd want replicated for every single year group. For me, the most important thing is actually to try and engage with my students and try to make sure that they're okay, that they're doing something useful, which, you know, you just really, I'd rather be making resources than actually doing loads and loads of marking just for marking's sake. Um, I think another thing is how students are actually accessing the work makes, a really big difference. So if you have a really fast internet connection, you're able to download lots of information. You can download videos, there's no lag, etc. But if you've got a slow internet connection, you're not going to be able to do that. And if you're sharing a device with other siblings in your house, there's obviously going to, you know, not going to be able to do the work at the same time. Or it could be that you're sharing the one laptop with the parent who also needs to work as well. So interestingly, I set some work for my year eight, it was actually, and I asked, because my subject's computer science, I said, if you were a computer scientist, um, and you, if you were the prime minister, and you could ask any computer scientist, what would they would do in the UK now for the students? They, the top answers were that they would give free internet access. Now, I thought that was quite interesting, and I've got evidence of that, so I can show you that. And the other top answer was they wanted access to a laptop at home because they couldn't write all the content they needed onto a tablet device. Now, I type, I can touch type, and I can tell you it's much, I can put a response to you far more quickly on my laptop than I could if I was trying to do it on a smartphone or a tablet. So I think when we talk about um, access to work, but also, as we have said, we're talking about inequalities here, about those that can access devices and internet connection, and those that um, have work environments or home environments that allow them to work quietly and perhaps not shared bedrooms, and especially for looked after children um, who are not necessarily in their real home environments, or for those children that might be in temporary housing where you've got you know a whole family literally sharing a room. I just have no idea how they're actually um, coping. I also concerned about um, students with English as an additional language because sometimes you would get an extra member of staff in in your classes to support those students. Well, you know, you can't do that online. Um, we've talked about SEND students as well, but we also got to think about our looked after children, um, who's just like checking on them, making sure they're just okay, which as I say in the class, you can do that um, um, visually. Um, yes, yes that yeah, just kind of because uh, conscious of time, yeah. I'm going to get a couple of questions in. Um, yeah, sure. One from uh, James, who's the parent of a year seven and a year 10 uh, student. Um, given we're in for a long lockdown, when can the children expect more contact hours with their teachers? For example, video classrooms, teacher led discussion, tutorials, one to one pastoral care. And a very different sort of question from Sarah. Do you agree that there's a general lack of consideration that teachers and school staff are also being affected by living through this pandemic emotionally and health wise? So it's not surprising that home learning is variable. We don't exist in a vacuum and teaching staff's mental health is affected too. So Charles, perhaps just a couple of contributions yes. on those questions. 
Shall I answer Paul back on? I can do the second one. I can do both actually. The second no, one. Do the second one. Yeah, so the second one, in terms of mental health, I think that's a really good one. The stresses on us has been massive, actually. Um, not just the workflow, because it takes so much longer to prepare resources and to answer all the emails um, and just do the work for, you know, preparing resources and, and lessons for students. But actually, I'm really worried about some of the students. When I look down at my photo list, I'm looking down thinking, oh, my God, I hope so-and-so is OK. Or, oh, my goodness. I really, really, you know, wonder how so-and-so is doing because I know they don't really get on with their mum's boyfriend or I know there's this issue at home or whatever. So I'm really worried about students, which I know other teachers are. And actually, it's just things like not being able to say goodbye properly to Year 11s. Um, so it's things like that, you know. You, you, you have students that you get on with in class. You, you miss the banter, really. I mean, I know they should all be working, but you do miss the personalities in class. It's what makes your job, you know, interesting. Thanks, Liz. Anyone else want to come in? Last opportunity. Uh, Hildy. Uh, yeah, uh, the, um, the, 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 the question about teachers and the variability in what they're able to provide, I think, is, is a really important one to bear in mind when we're talking about increasing or changing what we're offering to the families that live at home. Many teachers are also um, parents and carers as well and they might also be sharing devices and laptops and space and um, I know I am I was worried about the dog interrupting or a daughter or something or a husband <laughs> um, so, so that, that's very variable and they don't all, all have the same tech or the same technical mm. expertise uh, and the other thing that I think we have to bear in mind as well, as well is that as professionals working in schools we are not used to inviting people into our homes in this way we have lots of things to protect and safeguard our teachers um, and to safeguard their relationships with the pupils so we are negotiating a whole load of new areas that our staff are understandably worried about and that we as school leaders have to take account of and make sure that we protect them um, and so i think um, calls for more online learning are problematic in lots and lots of ways and also my children are only up until seven so online learning all day for them would be completely inappropriate um, anyway. So schools vary and circumstances vary hugely. Oh, thanks, Hildy. We're gonna draw it to a close there. Um, I think, uh, thank you for all the contributions from the panelists, from the local professionals, and indeed from people who've uh, sent in questions. I'm sorry we haven't been able to deal uh, with all of them. We just been able to take a few. Um, I think it's shown the complexity uh, of all the issues and that's why it's so important to get perspectives from those who are working directly in education at different levels and in different sectors um, and from parents as, and, and from campaign groups as well. Um, just a final thing, um, you may know that the National Education Union launched a petition uh, only open schools when it's safe to do so. Uh, that petition has got over 250,000 uh, signatures now but it's still open. So if you haven't signed it as yet, um, you've still got the opportunity to go onto the NEU website and to sign that petition. So thanks again to all the panelists and participants. Um, and we'd be interested in feedback on what people uh, think of this and how it's gone um, and perhaps organize uh, something similar um, in the future.